Well, hello, everybody. This is Jason Cisco, and we are live on a Wednesday. Welcome to Prayer Nation. We are so happy to have you with us today, wherever you might be watching and whenever you might be watching. Thank you for those that join us live. And for many of our uh, international community, you watch at a later time. Thank you so much for being a part of Prayer Nation. We approach this broadcast as a place where we do our best to equip the global church to be more effective in prayer. And as God taught me from the very beginning of this uh, broadcast and the very beginning of Prayer Nation, even before it was called Prayer Nation, the Lord expressed to me that I should treat this broadcast as talking to advanced spiritual warriors, that you are the cream of the crop, that those that are drawn to be a part of Prayer Nation are intercessors that have experience in the realm of the Spirit. And you are coming here to receive fresh inspiration. You are coming to join with others who have a similar passion and desire to see the kingdom of God come. We are here to solve difficult and, and complex problems that are not only facing the church, but also facing this generation. And we want to bring these things into the arena of the spirit and allow these higher dimensions, which God has created for us to be able to to filter down into our present and current existence in time and space. So we know that God inhabits eternity, and yet he also operates in time and space simultaneously. He is he who is and who was and who is to come. So he has understanding of all things, not just eternally, but also in time and space. All wisdom and all knowledge is hidden in him. And so because he is before all things and there will be none after him, we see him as our source of life and breath and of our existence. So there is no problem that we are dealing with that he cannot help us to understand. Sometimes these things are very difficult. And so today we are going to tackle something by the spirit of the Lord that I think will be helpful. And the goal today is not to be offensive. The goal is to be instructive. And for those that are in the battle and for those that are trying to understand, we want to decode this uh, LGBTQ plus community and what hell's agenda is around it and to try to speak with an apostolic mindset to what our response should be and can be. We also want to talk today about watch, walking that ridge line, that's, that, 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 that dangerous line between grace and truth that if we err on either side too far we can get out of bounds we can be disqualified as the people of god so as you've heard me talk often about mastery this was paul's number one is that when he was striving for the mastery he always wanted to strive lawfully that he did not get disqualified and so in everything that we do we want to do it god's way we want to do it with a right motive and with a right perspective. So let's start today by getting in alignment with God. I invite you to join with me right now, wherever you're joining with us from, whether it's from the East or from the West, whether you are uh, in the church a long time or whether you are just stepping into this arena of spiritual warfare and understanding the things of God, we want to just call upon God together and through the cross of Jesus Christ, step into this place place of truly being his hands and feet and reflecting his light in our faces. Father, we cannot do it without you. Without you, we are nothing. We come to you, Father, and we thank you that we feel the closeness of our bond in your presence because of your mercy towards us, your great mercy. Thank you for shedding your blood. Thank you for coming in the flesh, that the word was made flesh and tabernacled 
came and suka. You came and sukkahed among us. You took a temporary residence among us that we could behold you, that we could see you, that our hands could handle you, as John said. That word of life which was from the beginning and is now manifested unto us. We thank you, Father, and we sing that song of the redeemed. We thank you, Lord, for your blood that was shed for all of us, that you are the first begotten of the dead, that you may have many brethren that are brought to glory. And so, Lord Jesus, today we delight in calling you Father, Abba, Father. Let the spirit of adoption come to us today. Let us feel that kinship and oneness with you, and let us also feel that kinship and oneness with one another. Bring us into perfect alignment and in perfect rhythm today. We pray in Jesus' name that we would come into the eternal now, into the infinite here, into the center of that one God and the one emotion, that all other emotions would be subject to to that one emotion of your perfect love and that we will transcend the lower register of our carnal man and of the sin nature and that through the redemption and through the transformation that has come through the new birth that we can be like you as he is your word says so are we in this world i want you to stop for a minute right now we have already prayed such intense prayers and such focused prayers right now would you stop with me right now and would you just lift your hands and thank the lord that we are partakers of the divine nature father we thank you today that we are partakers of the divine nature that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of your son that you are the last Adam. We thank you that we no longer are subject to the corruption of the first Adam, but the incorruption of the last Adam. We thank you, Father, that immortality will swallow up mortality and that death will be swallowed up with life. And so we invoke the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that makes us free from the law of sin and death. And so in Jesus' name, we rejoice. We rejoice that you are with us. Now let's take the whole armor of God on today. Would you do that with me? Confess right now with your mouth, I take my loins girt about with truth. Say this out loud, that truth would be in my inward parts, that I would hate the lie that I would hate all that is deception, that I would know the truth and that the truth will make me free. In Jesus' name, I take my loins girt about with truth. Now put your hands across your chest and say, I take the breastplate of righteousness, not by works of righteousness, which I have done, but by his mercy, he has saved us. And so I take the righteousness of Christ by faith. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So say it with me now. He has taken my sin and I have received his righteousness. I have the righteousness of Christ. Now for our feet, touch your feet if you can right now in Jesus' name. Or just put your hands towards your feet and say, I take my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I walk in peace everywhere I go. I bring peace everywhere I go. I take grace and mercy, and through that grace and that mercy, I create an environment of peace, and my peace is my power. I want you to confess this. I will not back up. I will only go forward in Jesus' name, and I am prepared everywhere I go to bring good news. All right, thank you, Jesus, for that. Now we take our helmet of salvation. The helmet was designed, it was personalized to every Roman soldier. Contrary to common belief, they would decorate them. They would make them unique. Uh, sometimes we just think they were just uniform, and they were not. They were unique to each soldier. And so God has given us a unique experience of salvation uh, that we have. It is our testimony. It is uniform in the sense that it is the salvation of God that he gives to all men, but we have our own unique experience of salvation. It means that I ultimately believe that I will be saved. I will be completely changed, that my vile body will be like unto his glorious 
body someday. And if I believe that someday I'm being carried away into heaven, then I can believe that he will take care of everything between now and then. He will save me from this ungodly generation. So I have the helmet of salvation, a mindset of salvation. I have the shield of faith. Now just put your hands out. This is living in proof of the truth. So I want you to say that. Say, I live in the proof of the truth. My faith is validated by experience in Jesus' name. I operate in the special shield that God has given to me as a faith that knocks down every fiery dart of the wicked one and quenches every explosive lie that could destroy me. It knocks it down and keeps it from exploding. And finally, the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, the Bible says, the rhema word of God. You and I have specific rhemas over our lives and we take that together right now and we war. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that you have given us your word holistically and collectively, but you have also given us individual rhemas that through the spirit of God, we speak utterances, we declare in the name of Jesus and through these rhema words, we overcome every valley we come through every adversity. Every crooked place is made straight. Every rough place is made smooth. Every, every mountain and hill is laid low. Every valley is raised up. Father, I thank you. It brings us straight to who you are, that we can be as you desire us to be, that we can walk, oh God, after your footsteps and in your steps, and that people will take knowledge of us that we have been with Jesus. Now, finally, we submit ourselves, spirit and soul and body, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we take right now, in Jesus' name, the holiness of God within our being, the holiness of God in our bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. We present, we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. We sanctify God in our body and in our spirit, according to 2 Corinthians 7. Both of these are, are, are to receive the holiness of God that he might be glorified in Jesus' name. And our whole soul, uh, our spirit, soul, and body are preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. So our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, these things are being transformed now. My will surrendered to his will. My emotions surrendered to his emotions. My thoughts to his thoughts. So I have miracle eyes. I have miracle ears. I have a miracle mind. I have a miracle heart. And I have miracle emotions in Jesus' name. We have the weapons of our warfare. We have the word, the name, the blood, the spirit, the angels. We launch those weapons through praise, through worship, through intercession, through speaking in tongues, through preaching, and through singing. We launch those weapons. We release them by what comes out of our mouth. And in 5784, this is the decade of utterance. This is the decade of, of the speaking, of the declaring in heaven and echoing it in the earth. We echo his authority in the earth. But we also walk through a, an open door in this year of 5784, 2024. An open door is for us and we are walking through it. So we give God praise today day and we thank him for hearing us let's clap our hands to the lord and let's give him praise right now in jesus name now as i was preparing uh this week the lord impressed me so strongly it was something that i could not get away from that we must discuss the lgbtq plus question mark uh community we must de decode this from a spiritual and practical and try our very best to do this in a sensitive way in which that we can use discernment and operate in a spirit of love and redemptiveness that can be restorative but it can also be insightful so that we can understand the difference between the people that are in this movement and the spirit that is behind it. There are aspects of this that are aggressive, as you know, and there are aspects that are very passive. There are parts of this that are individually, individually nuanced, and then there are some things that are very much the same, and they're very collective.
And so I want to try to address this. And today, as I was looking at it, I came up, the Lord gave me 10 different points that I would like to discuss with you today. And we will pray through these. And again, in the spirit of this, if you are in that community or you have struggled with these areas in your life, I, I want to speak with life today. I am not speaking in condemnation because the Bible does not use condemnation as a part of the 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 words of Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So we know that from Romans 8, but we also know from John 3, 17, for the son of God came not into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. So this is our this is our concept today. So we have to lie, uh, lay down a baseline and then we come back fr from an Old Testament perspective and then we come back to a New Testament perspective of what the scriptures say. And there's hope in all of these things. And I will tell some personal stories today. And the Lord impressed me to be very vulnerable with you today. So that's what we're going to do. Well, the first thing that I want you to understand uh, as we begin this is that the, the goal, satanic goal, uh, and the intent of this movement, okay, we're talking about it from a, from a, a large-scale standpoint, the goal is to create a barrier between Protestant or between Christianity as a whole, but primarily evangelicals and Protestants who have taken a stand on this subject and have taken the Bible and not tradition as their uh, moral compass and as how they orient their lives. These uh, the evangelicals um, have a Pentecostal charismatic, uh, especially have taken this standpoint as the Bible is the inspired word of God. And whether we like it or not, whether it hits me or someone else, God's word is true and it's inerrant. And so we preach that as true. So what, they, what, what the goal is, is to create a, a, an issue with LGBTQ plus that is so big and is so prominent that it will create a barrier between the young people that are coming up in the culture who are hearing this constantly preached to them that it's okay, that it's, that it's just another uh, form of love and that you can't choose who you love or who you are attracted to. And everyone knows someone who is a nice person who is gay or lesbian or trans or whatever, pansexual, bisexual, questioning, everybody has experienced it in some way. And so making it more and more common so that uh, the church is seen as just being antiquated, bigoted, um, and it would create this barrier. So it would, it would keep people who would maybe naturally be inclined to go to church, might want to go and hear the word of the Lord, might be attracted to the love of Jesus and experiencing God's presence. But because of this one issue that is so much being popularized, um, and you don't want to go against it because then you would be the one that is oddball out that they would just simply write off religion, put it all in one big category and then rationalize uh, the tolerance of these behaviors. So that's number one is that the enemy wants to use this as a barrier to uh, to to try to uh Take away, number two, to break the influence of two things, of biblical values, and to break the influence of the church. So through the generations, especially in America, the most powerful people in America from the very inception of the United States were preachers. Preachers got up in the pulpits and they preached morality. They preached Judeo-Christian values. They preached what the traditional home would be like. Their authority was very much established in, uh, in the institutional, uh, governmental, legislative, and family life of, of Americans. 
we can talk about Harvard and Yale and all of those initial colleges that were first founded in the beginning of the United States. They were Bible colleges in the beginning. You went there to study how to preach and how to be in the clergy because the clergy were the most influential people. They even, they even uh, were, uh, were very much involved in the governance process of establishing what was practical law and how it should be carried out. Much of America was even founded on a religious protest um, of how church and state that there was only one religion uh, that was acceptable, the Anglican church and following King George, you know, who was the head of the state. And so they came here to practice freedom of religion that's one of the founding parts. So I realize that this is a global broadcast and there are other nations and other cultures that are represented here, but we are talking about this uh, from a cultural standpoint. The United States are the culture kings of the world, that no matter where you go in the world, there is an American influence. You could go to Papua New Guinea and people are wearing t-shirts from America. Uh, no matter what nation of the world, there is an influence. And whether uh, you're in the Middle East where you call America the great Satan because of the loose morals uh, that are being taught and they, they would say, you know, we are against the morality of the United States or whether it's other uh, more democratic places that see America as a, as a bastion of liberty, which is interpreted as let me do what I want and don't control my actions. So uh, we see that this is where the battleground is for these things. Europe has long since uh, been very open uh, and tolerant and, 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 and lives in a different more, has a different moral uh, compass. They have been secularized. They have been embracing of these things for a long time. So this is where the evan evangelical church has had its strongest influence has been in the United States. So if the United States falls, uh, our role as a Christian nation was propagating the gospel, sending missionaries and Bibles, 80% of the world's missionaries, 80% of the world's Bibles, the, the global missions effect uh, that, that the United States has upon the world is unrivaled by any other nation. So this is a way to try to erode that biblical culture through a pagan invasion. Now you have to understand that the spirit of Jezebel works hand in hand with the Antichrist spirit. When I met the spirit of Antichrist, and I believe it was 1993, I have to go back and look at my notes specifically, but I was in Madison, Wisconsin, when the spirit of Antichrist appeared in my room, out from his side came Jezebel. And it was a parallel of the church, because out of the side of Jesus, the blood and water flowed, and those were the elements for making the church, the new birth, water and, and blood. That's the baptism in Jesus' name and being filled with the Holy Spirit, the new birth, born of the water and born of the Spirit. So Satan has his own version of this. There is a great whore, the great woman who sits upon the beast. This is the false church, and it's coming in with the false prophet. That's that spirit uh, of seduction. That she was called a woman of whoredoms. And this is that Jezebel side. It is a feminine side and a masculine side of the spirit of Antichrist. So what did Jezebel do? She came in with immorality. She she came in with sensuality to create a question mark on absolute truth. So the Ashtoreth Pole was a place where there was um, all kinds of dancing and music and uh, per per perversity. But so we oftentimes just see Jezebel as being a, a harlot or whoredoms. But that was not the main. That was not the main part. She was bringing in a new doctrine, and she was using this uh, to compromise the morals. That if I compromise the morals, it's the spirit of Balaam. If I can get you to fornicate, you'll break your covenant, and then God will be angry with you, and then you will not be able to stand up in battle. It is the morality that keeps the covenant in effect, which causes our doctrine to remain strong. So this was a way to, to destroy. So these things, these, these, 
the, these, uh, this constant infusion of perversity of all kinds is there to design, is, is a design to destroy the power of truth to undo the influence of the Bible. Now, what do we see in these Bible colleges, Harvard and Yale and all of them? They are far cry from what they used to be. They have become secular universities. And so the third point of all of this is in the undermining of the biblical values and the undermining of the church's influence. Now we want to destroy the traditional home. We want to destroy the family dynamic, making it fluid. This is, this is especially true of LGBTQ+. The traditional home, you would say uh, man and woman, some would say they have an open relationship, but they would still say it is not conventional. So when there is adultery, women, they still do not want a man to commit adultery. There, there, are, there are men that still do not want their wives to commit adultery. It happens. Uh, there are affairs that happen all the time. Uh, and this is why the divorce rate is so high from all of these affairs, et cetera, that are going on. But they will tell you, even, if it's, even though it's heterosexual, they will still tell you it's wrong. What we see with homosexuality is that not only are, are, is it going against the conventional order, the conventional way of, of family and producing of children, but they will also whitewash it and say there's nothing wrong with it. So it's, it's double-edged in the sense that it goes against convention, goes against the natural use, and we will read those scriptures in a moment, but they also will say there's nothing wrong with it. Now, an adulterous woman, the Bible tells us, will eat, wipe her mouth, and say, I've done nothing wrong. What does that mean? So this is a, this is a concept within the scriptures. And if you want to look at that, we can read that just for a minute, and I can explain uh, the concept here. So we know the, uh, the, the impact of these things are, are very real. Uh, the Bible says, you know, adultery leaves a mark. Uh, that will not go away. You can be recovered from it. You can be delivered from it. Of course, the woman caught in adultery, uh, she was able to be restored, and that was a beautiful thing. That was a beautiful thing. But um, when you uh, come to you know the end of that story, there's still a mark. There's still a, a weight that that is found there. Now let me. Let me go to this. I wasn't prepared for this verse, but I, so I'm going to have to look just for a minute um, and find this in Proverbs. Yes, ver chapter 30. I was one chapter off. Chapter 30 of the book of Proverbs. Let me show you this. Such is the way, verse 20, such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. So what does that mean? Uh, you find another verse that says that the adulteress or the will will hunt for the precious life. So what is that? What is that talking about? So uh, when I, when I when I would read these texts, I would try to uh, understand them. Is that a, an, a perverse woman is not going to look for another perverse man? Um, maybe a perverse man would look for a perverse woman, but in this context. Uh, and or perverse uh, ver, vice versa yes there is there is some of that but there's also there's also an element of this that says i would rather take down someone who is innocent i would rather i would rather feed on that she's she's wiping her mouth she's eating what does that mean i'm feeding on their innocence someone who has already been um compromised or someone who's already feeling shame someone who's already feeling um that they have lost their purity uh they want to they want to they want to watch someone else give them their innocence so they take the innocence of that person and then they project their shame upon that person so the person who who is innocent who first partakes walks around with shame feeling horrible guilt for what they have done but the adulterous woman that one who is who has brought them into their snare as you could read many proverbs about this chapter five six seven you can read about this 
uh, this would be uh, this would be them savoring the innocence of that person is that they relive their innocence in that moment. So there is a certain amount of this that says I've done nothing wrong or a way to try to push down the conscience. So this is also happening, I believe, in the same way uh, with other forms of immorality, is that that innocence is what is being fed on, and then that projection is that that person who is innocent that does it, there is a projection of guilt or shame or embarrassment that is on them, while the person who participated as the aggressor in the situation or the initiator in the situation feels no wrong. So these are all devices that we see that are uh, in the nuances of all of this. But the design, Satan's design, going back to number three, is to destroy the family dynamic. Is that if the father no longer has the influence or the mother no longer has the influence or if the family values no longer have the influence, there's something here that is different that is, that is making them make a choice between what is conventional and what is not, between what, what is... Um, been acceptable in times past to what is now being pushed as acceptable. And so it, it it's designed to where this, I'm going to embrace them because I love them. It's still my son. It's still my daughter. But it creates this, this constant struggle between these value systems of love and acceptance and what is truth and what is a lie, what is moral and what is not moral, what is said to be okay and what deep in our spirits and our convictions and our conscience we know is not okay. So this, this complexity is designed so that the culture is stronger than the family. And the less the family unit has power, the less the Bible has power, the less the church has power, the more the Antichrist system brings us into a collective where we just hear one voice. We just hear one sound. And everybody in that culture is looking around, and now they feel this we're right this generation knows better we know what is true we know how things are supposed to be and all of you in former generations you don't know what you're talking about so that brings us to the earlier part of of, of proverbs um 30. there is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes yet is not washed from their filthiness there is a generation oh how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up there is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. So he's saying, look, there is a generation. This is something that reoccurs. This is something that, that happens. This is a generation. This is a mindset. This is something that comes that Satan is after this. This is his desire. And so we are feeling this and sensing this, um, uh, this, this cursing their father and not blessing their mother, a destroying of the family a revelation knowledge and the sanctity of values that are passed from generation to generation. This is why the spirit of Elijah has to come in the wake of Jezebel at the end of the, of the Old Testament, Malachi saying to turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children, the children back to their fathers. What is this for? Lest I smite the earth with a curse. There are some things that come through revelation knowledge through the generations, but if there is a block there, the enemy is doing his best to use this issue to try to create a block that is so massive that it overrides everything else. Number four, it is to empower the individual. LGBTQ plus is to empower the individual. Perversity, um, fornication, adultery, bisexuality, immorality, all of these things, but especially leading this way is to say you have to accept who you are no matter what your parents tell you. You have to accept who you are. You have to be true to what you know is right. And so it's this empowering of the individual and then from all of these individuals experiencing this then they become a collective voice of individuality that says individual choice is the center it is the heart of this don't tell me who i can love or don't tell me um, what i can or cannot do and this is the heart of rebellion this is the heart of all perversion of every kind 
um, is that um, um, that is that I'm I'm my own person. And you can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me where the lines are. And so this becomes this powerful force that is constantly driving away um, all traditional forms of authority in the culture. Number five, all forms of traditional authority must be broken for the man of lawlessness to be revealed. So this is what, he, what the scripture says, is that the mystery of iniquity already works. When the Antichrist comes, it's going to be a lawlessness. It's going to be lawless. Let's see what it says in the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 11, it gives us a description of what he's going to be like. And so let's look at this. Uh, it, it, is, it is astonishing uh, what the scripture says about this. And when you get down to, let's talk about, let's see, verse number 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. So a covenant uh, breaking the covenant, and it's through flattery, it's through appealing, it's through these beautiful silky words, it's through, uh, it's through a, a changing of calling good evil and evil good. So the Antichrist is going to take Christ-sounding words or biblical-sounding words and then change their meanings. It's the power of Google. It's the power of the able to update your Bible app. Do you realize that the NIV keeps updating because they're removing scriptures? Even the ESV uh, is being updated and verses are being changed. So every time in your Bible app, it says update, you don't realize it, but there's subtle nuances of scriptures just going away, meanings being changed. Now we go to Google for everything. We don't go to our father anymore and ask dad because Google knows best. It's not father knows knows best. It's not grandpa knows best. It's now those guys didn't know what Google knows. And so Google is established as the authority or the search engine, Bing or whoever you want to look at or Wikipedia, but these things can all be edited. We can constantly change. So these living languages of, 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 of encyclopedias constantly being updated into what it used to mean is not what it means anymore. So this is, this is a relative truth. Such as do wickedly, they shall corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword. They're going to be persecuted. They're going to, by the flame, by captivity, by spoil, many days. Now they which shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them, uh, with flatteries and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for an appointed for a time appointed and the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god self-exaltation independence and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that which is determined to shall be done. Neither shall he regard, are you ready? The God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. This is the spirit of Antichrist that is already in the world. This is what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to break with all of the traditional values of Judeo-Christianity. He's going to break. He, he's going to have a source that comes from there so the Jews will embrace him, so the world will embrace him, so he can bring peace in the Middle East. He'll have a little bit of Jew, a little bit of Arab, a little bit of Euro, a little bit of Afro, a little bit of, a little bit of Asian, a little bit of everything. He'll have some kind of way to relate to all the generations and to all of the ethnicities of the world and yet he will not follow those traditions that have controlled men through the generations through religion he will not he will not have the desire of women this is what it says in kjv it means other things when you look at it in different translations uh, but it can mean here what you think it means that he will not follow traditional family values or traditional heterosexual relationships he will not regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. The exalting of self, 
This is what is at the heart of all these things. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Lovers of them own, of their own selves. So let's go back to that text now in Second, uh, in Second uh, Timothy, in Second Timothy, uh, chapter three. We have these abuses. Now, what is this? These are all abuses of the word love. In 2 Timothy 3, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. So this is the first of several uses in Greek of the word love, lovers of themselves. So here we have philo autos. So usually philio is for someone else. It's now reversed and used for self. What does it do? Then it comes to covetousness and it's phila argios, which is now another word for love, love of money. And then you have boasters is alazone here and proud hyper ephanos appearing above others, haughty or proud. I'm better than you. So boasters, alazan, braggarts or pretenders, these who will lie, uh, lie to your face, smile at you and uh, boast and, and, uh, and prevaricate because they don't love they don't love others better than they love themselves. They want their money more than they love their people. And so they will be boasters. They will be pretenders. They will be proud. I'm better than you. I know better than you. Blasphemers. Uh, this is... This is speaking evil or slanderous or reproachful or railing. This is a generation that we're talking about in Proverbs 30, disobedient to parents. So this is to have a, 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 an acoustic view of parental authority, of saying that we are we are breaking. This is that family breaking. This is the goal of this uh, of this of this spirit that's behind this. There's an antichrist spirit that's driving this. Unthankful. There's no gratitude here at all. And then uh, we have the word unholy. So it is to take anything that is pure, anything that is righteous, and to reverse it and to make it unholy. Without natural affection. This is asta argos in the Greek. Um, it is, uh, this can be not just without family love, but this can mean uh, to be violent without natural affection is that you override or the heart is made very hardened. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. So we constantly see these, these, all this list. What does he say? Having a form of godliness, all of this trying to put under uh, a, a guise of, of, of godliness to protect it, to whitewash it, denying the power of any, of any truth, of from such the bible says turn away from such turn away so uh this is the goal is to create a rebellious society that is resistant to any authority uh and so bringing in the antichrist and the antichrist spirit number six this is specific what Satan's goal is for LGBTQ. And let's go to the book of uh, Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter number one. Uh, this is to debase the image of God. It is to debase the image of God. That is the goal. Now, for those that are practicing this or have, or have had issues with this, they would not say this. They would not think this. Uh, uh, and we'll talk about the nuances of this in just a little bit, but I would like us to stop for a minute right now. And I hope that you can feel my heart. I hope that you can understand uh, that I'm just trying to decode the spirit behind this, the agenda of hell behind this. We are not attacking people. We are talking about the mindsets, just like I would deal with any spirit. We try to, betw between any stronghold, between anything that gets, that gets rooted into a culture or a church church or a family or anything that would come against me 
Um, I want to find out what is the mindset behind this. The Bible is true. God's word is true. What God says is right. He has a purpose for all these things. And there's a reason why he has made us the way that he has made us. And so we want to, we want to do it his way. Let's pray just for a minute. Father, right now, we pray for grace. We pray for infusion of hope and life and strength. Help me, oh God, as we continue through these revelation knowledge uh, points that you've given me. I pray, Lord Jesus, that there would be just an unraveling of all of hell's agenda, that there would be an unraveling, Lord Jesus, of the deception, that you would release us all from the, from the, uh, the, the, the fear, oh God, and the, the, the paralyzing of our emotions and not knowing even what to do or how to respond to these things. And give us grace, Lord Jesus, for redemption, for health, for healing, oh God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So let's look at Romans 1, starting at Romans 1 and 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God is saying you don't need a Bible to know that there's only one God. You don't need a Bible to know that there is a creator. It's in everything in creation. Everything that you put under a microscope is organized. There is DNA in everything. DNA are the, uh, are the codes of creation. It doesn't give us the manual, but it gives us the parts list. That's what DNA is. So it would be like when you open up a box, like I'm gonna put together um, you know, a bicycle, there would be a parts list there for me. And then there is an instruction kit of how to put those pieces where they need to go. DNA is the parts list and it's in everything. So a fruit fly has 98% of the same DNA as a human. But obviously, fruit flies and humans are vastly different because there is a designer behind it. But God left the DNA sequences there to let us know it was the same divine design. So the invisible things of him, God put, it, put an order in the world. It's not random. And that randomness... Um, is, is not seen anywhere in the universe. If there's the slightest bit of change in, in the distance of the sun to the earth, we would either freeze or burn up. Or the tilt of the earth, we would either freeze or burn up. I mean, uh, it's called the anthropic principle in science, is that the universe was specifically designed to accommodate life. There's a specific formula that allows life to exist on the earth. And if it was random, it is impossible that it could have just, uh, it, it, the, the, the amount of, uh, of calculations of what, what it would, would be would be worse than an explosion in a printing press would cause there to be a, a, the, the producing of an encyclopedia or a dictionary. Oh, yeah, we, there an explosion happened and a book was created. No, no, somebody had to write that book. Someone had to publish that book. So before there was a, a, a thought uh, there was a thinker in the beginning was the word. So we see this all through creation. But verse 21 says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. In other words, they knew it, they saw it, but they didn't want to accept it. That is the heart of rebellion. That is the carnal mind. And that is Luciferian thought. What I call Luciferian thinking. In heaven, during the first rebellion, Satan said, and we hear the words quoted in Isaiah 14, I will be like the Most High. He raised himself up. He said, I want to be like God. He didn't want to worship God, and rather he wanted to be a worshiper uh, not longer of God, but as God. He wanted to be a God alongside of the God. And we learn from Luke 10 that he was cast down like lightning from heaven. So he was saying, what gives God the right to be worshiped? It was a challenge of his right to be worshiped. And this is the foundation of the devil's kingdom, is a challenge of what gives God the right to be worshiped, what makes God God. 
So in the garden, what does he tell the woman? He tells her, if you eat this, you'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. There is a knowledge that is created when you break from obedience and break from being a God worshiper. She was already in the divine image. She was already empowered with dominion. She was already blessed. She was already living according to her divine design. And and her maximum potential was just being ready to be re realized. But now she loses that glory. The man loses his glory. They walk out of that paradise. So he's saying, look, when they knew God, this is what happens. The carnal mind was created in that moment. It is that enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That's what the carnal mind does. It push, It becomes vain. It becomes empty in its imaginations. And then the foolish heart is darkened, professing themselves to be wise. I'm so wise. Oh, now I know. I know the knowledge of good and evil. I know what the angels know. I know what the spirit world knows. But what do they do? We start tinkering with things. They change the glory of, an, of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men. Now it's, now we want God in our likeness. We conform God to be like us rather than us being conformed to his image. So then it's birds and four footed beasts and creeping things. These are all uh, adulterated versions of creation and worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. So he's saying, look, when you start changing things in nature, when you start changing definitions, when you start, when you start rejecting what you know to be true, then there's all kinds of imaginations and all kinds of evils, and you start tinkering with things. He said he gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. So he is saying sexuality has a natural use. There's a natural way that God made for a man and a woman in the marriage context to share a beautiful intimacy that produces uh, offspring. God made it to be a very special and holy and sanctified thing. And now they've changed it into something else. And he says, it's vile affections. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. In the Greek here, um, it's very, it's, it, it, it doesn't really mean anything different than what you would expect it to mean unseemly or, uh, or opposite and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. In other words, there's something about this uh, hack of the human body that created some kind of a, uh, of a pleasure, he said, but it was a recompense of their error. There is something in that, there's also an error in that, which was caught, will cause them to be judged by God. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they don't want God in their mind now. They have determined to go down this path. So it's the overriding of conscience. So the debasing of the image is, is, uh, is, is what is at stake here. God made us a certain way, and it's debasing that image. They did not retain God in their knowledge, and God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. This is a destroying of conscience, and we will get to this in just a moment. So uh, this is, number seven, a, per, a perspective of a collective victimization understanding. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. But there's a collectiveness here, uh, being filled with unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, spiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Another list here to Romans, just like to Timothy, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, 
but have pleasure in them that do them. That's the bottom line, where Satan is wanting to take it. The debasing of all these images, when you start down this path, this is where it leads. Now, what will, what will happen is that because there, there are scriptures like this in the Bible, this is where this feeling of judgmentalism will come from. And that the LGBTQ plus especially will say, see, we're incompatible. Um, this judgmental, you are so judgmental that this is just hate speech. So it makes them all victims collectively because we are outside of the conventional or outside of the acceptable view of a Judeo-Christian value system. And because in times past these things were illegal, uh, they were looked at as neurosis or something that was psychologically broken. Um, this was even from secular people for a time. Uh, homosexuality was very much against, it taught against in certain cultures around the world. It was acceptable in other places you could be killed for it. So there is this uh, uh, collective victimization that is there, which basically uh, takes this viewpoint uh, that we're the next iteration of civil rights. And so they take the legitimacy of the civil rights movement and they hijack it. Now, someone that is born a certain skin color cannot change their skin, at least not easily. Um, so you didn't choose that you were born African American or chose or, or born Asian or born, you know, uh, Caucasian or whatever. And so the civil rights battle is that this is how you were made and we should accept you and give you equal value and equal rights as an individual. But uh, some, some would say, well, I was born gay or I was born lesbian. And there are many people that maybe are born with those tendencies, yes. But can you change? There are many people who started off gay that are no longer gay. There are many people who, uh, who chose to be a uh, lesbian who are no longer lesbian. So you can never say I, I'm an, I'm an, uh, I'm a former black person or I'm a former Asian or I'm a, you know, I'm a former. And so the enemy is trying to uh, co-opt this, this front here. And uh, they're all being lumped in to the same category of a legitimate issue that needs to be resolved, which is race relations and inserting that in and riding on that wave. Number eight is to make any and all opposition to their viewpoint lifestyle as hate speech. So I'm not allowed to say anything. There are certain places around America. You cannot even read certain Bible scriptures like I just read today. I could be thrown in jail. Um, I might be banned on YouTube because I, I just read these verses. And I'm, I'm certainly not uh, out here speaking hate speech against anyone. Or uh, I'm just saying this is what the Bible says happens. And... Um, I, I'm trying to reconcile the issue with where people are actually at and what Satan is trying to do to drive us a certain way and how it's incompatible uh, with certain viewpoints within the word of God. And what, what do we do about it? How do we respond to it? Well, let me show you what 1 Corinthians 6 says. This is our hope today. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us a list again paul is giving us a very a very simple list verse number nine know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god be not deceived neither fornicators no, nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind uh, in one translation it literally says male prostitutes here uh, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this is a long list. It's not just effeminate or homosexuals. They're included there. Uh, but there's also idolaters and fornicators and adulterers and thieves and covetous, etc. Drunkards, revilers, extortioners, all of these on this list. But here's the, here's the beautiful part. And such were some of you, but ye are washed but you are sanctified, but you are justified. What's telling us is that no matter what our issues were, no matter how far away we were from God, no matter how much we, we were um, into all of these perversions or, or elements of immorality or, 
or wickedness. It doesn't matter. He's able to save to the uttermost. Such were some of you. You can be free. You can be delivered. I had one man that had been deeply entrenched in homosexuality, and uh, he, I, I baptized him in Jesus' name. And sometime later, I was in the pulpit, and I was preaching, and it, it just a part of my reading, some of the verses came up, and I hesitated just for a minute. And then I continued reading what they said, and I was feeling the sensitivity, not wanting to be offensive to him because of where he came out of, but at the same time, wanting to preach the word of God. He came to me after the service, and he said, Pastor, preach the word of God. That's what saved me me. That's what pulled me out. Do not hesitate. You must keep standing for what is right. That's what saved my soul. So I want to tell you today that our goal is to help. Our goal is to reach for those that are questioning, for those that are struggling, for those that are feeling that bondage, that are ready to come out. And the enemy has told you, you cannot be saved or you cannot be helped, or there's nothing but judgmentalism and hate speech. No, that is not true. What we are saying is that you have to be against something in order for you to realize, that it's wrong. I cannot be saved until I know that I am lost. But in the moment that I realize that something is wrong, then we have to understand the redemptive power of the Holy Spirit, whether it is extortion or being drunk or being a reviler or being a thief or any other part of immorality that might be in the scriptures. This is one of many in a list, but thank God you can be washed today. Thank God you can be sanctified today. Thank God such were some of of you. You can have your own testimony. Hallelujah. Let's stop and thank the Lord for the grace of God. Thank you, Jesus. 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 So the whole point of everyone being a victim of hate speech or being a victim of judgmental or bigoted thoughts, uh, the result is that um, you know, the only place where you'll be accepted is in this uh, community, this LGBTQ plus community. And that's where you're just told to override your conscience and just accept that this is who you are. Number nine, blurring the lines uh, in society creates a constant movement of less and less resistance and more and more tolerance, giving full access to this community, to schools, government institutions, businesses, entertainment, and social media. A small percentage of people. Why? Because homosexuals cannot reproduce themselves. Lesbians cannot reproduce themselves. They must recruit. It, it, you can't, re the, they, they, it, 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 it ta it's a mentality and a spirit. And so we will talk about, uh, we will talk about this. Number 10 is that there is a, is a sexual exploration and an exposure before puberty. This is the goal, is to create more and more tolerance, more and more lines being blurred. Well, we don't know what to say, we don't want to do, we just kind of turn around and say, well, let them do what they want. They want to be married, let them get married. It, it, you can't help who you love, just, well, you know, that's just the way they are, and just kind of accept them and let's just all get along. That's the whole point. So that they have more and more access, they can constantly speak it. You know, here's a here's a picture, little Johnny in preschool. You know, one has two mommies, one has two daddies, and then there's a mommy and a daddy. You know, like this is normal, spoken as normal from the very beginning. When you do this, it gives a full access for that for that mentality to be put upon people before they have capacity to make decisions, before they have cognitive ability, before they're shaped and formed. They're trying to hit them at five, six, seven, eight years old so that there's a lot of gender confusion. The more you have this gender confusion, the more possibility that you're gonna have a problem. Now, let me just talk for a few minutes and I realize that our time is gone already. But I wanna talk about this for just a few moments here today. What's on the other side of this? Let's talk about the personal nuance. I wanna tell my own personal story. So my dad was a very strong man. Uh, he traveled a lot and I'm very thankful for him. I, this is, there's no um, wound there, no, no real deep wound there, but I had strong mom and I had two strong sisters. They were older than me. And there was a lot of women around me growing up, especially during my uh, uh, adolescent and uh, right during puberty and growing up. I, there was a lot of female energy around me. I wanted to please my mom, wanted to please my sisters. Um, I wanted to be liked um, and I wanted to be loved. 
there was times when my sisters would play with my hair. They would get a curling iron to it and do all kinds of stuff to it. Um, I was learning to be more refined. I would hear uh, kind of stories about people that were uncouth or didn't take care of themselves and, um, you know, wanted to be uh, look good, wanted to be handsome, wanted to be all those things. But there was a, a point when um, in my in my early years, I felt very different because God had a calling on my life. Um, I, I saw things and knew things other people didn't see or hear. I felt different from people. And there was some point during this formative stage when there was a lot of feminine influence. My dad was not so much around, a very strong mother uh, in my life. And I felt very different. Uh, and the enemy said to me, you're different. You're not always going to fit in. And I said, that's, that's probably right. And then he said, it's because you're gay. And right at that moment, I could feel something trying to get a hold of me. And then the Holy Spirit came up and said, that's a lie. And I said, no, no, that's not what I am. I am not gay. And then I felt this thing move away from me. And I realized at that moment that God had allowed me to go through this, this short stage of my life, few months or whatever of my life, where there was a little bit more feminine influence. There was a little in that formative stage of who I was. And I'm still trying to find out if I'm going to be liked, if I'm going to be embraced, if I'm going to fit in. And I still liked sports and I still liked all those things, but there was also this other side trying to explore and understand this is what, this is what the enemy does to everybody. This is what the enemy is trying to do full scale in a generation. Uh, in so much that in college, they're teaching, for example, in Ohio State University, they're teaching a class 50 shades of gay. In other words, everybody is gay. How many shades in are you? Instead of 50, 50 shades of, of gray, it's 50 shades of gay. That there's so much access to perversity. There's so much access to sexuality. Everything is commonplace. There is no shame anywhere. And just embrace, where are you on that spectrum? You know, Everybody's got a little bit of this in them. And there's something different about you except that you're gay. That's trying to force it. And the enemy was trying to put that on me. And then sometime later, I was walking down the street at night and a car pulled up and, and a, a gay man propositioned me. And I was like, what? And then I had to yell, get out of here. And he ran away. Now, later on, I'm traveling. I'm a single man traveling in Australia. And there was a, 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 a gay woman came to me after the service and said, I understood what you were saying. I understood your story. I know why you're alone and why you're, what, what your struggles are. And I was preaching about the love of God and sharing some of my story of loneliness and the pain of rejection in my life at different points. And, and she said, oh, I understand all of this. It's because you're gay. Trying to put this on me, trying to tell me something. And this was in the church. And I was like, no, you are wrong. No, you are wrong. So what I'm telling you is that with no abuse in my life, there was a spirit that tried to, at different points and at different times of my formation of my life, try to come on me. So yes, there is something, that is the, that is the covert version, but it is a spirit. It is a spirit that tries to get on you in a vulnerable time. And the Holy Spirit exposed it so that I could understand it, so I could see what goes on. Now, if you were to have an experience, if that was a thought that was in your mind, and then you were also to have an experience, your physical body will respond, whether it's a male or a female. And then you have an emotion and you have a sexual experience that is a memory. It will attach itself to you and you can see how quickly that that could be infused into your identity. So the, 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 the overt way is that there is an aggressive point somewhere where someone does something, whether it's an abuse in an early age or whether it's later on in life where someone uh, makes an advance towards you and you have some kind of a, of a sexual response that happens to you that says, well, maybe there is. And it's just because your body is going to react. It doesn't mean that that's who you are. So let me show you, uh, let me tell you a story of how I helped a young man. 
So we had a young man, I will, won't tell you where it was that I dealt with. Uh, he was in his early 20s and someone had told me, you know, that he was really struggling and gone to a gay bar and, you know, that he was participating in some way, you know, with another man in this gay bar and he was not wanting to come to church anymore. And so I said, fine, let's, uh, let's, let's talk to him. So I called him up and said, hey, let's talk for a coffee. And we went out for a coffee and I sat across from him and I wasn't, I didn't act repulsed or I just smiled at him and loved him like I think Jesus would love anybody. And he was a really nice young man, played the piano, was really talented. And, um, he, you know, he looked at me and he says, I'm not coming back to church. I said, fine. I'm not wanting you to come back to church. I said, I just want you to have a relationship with God. And he said, well, you know, I, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just as the way I'm wired and God would have to rewire me. And I said, well, he can. I said, but let's just talk about this for a little bit. And so the Lord just gave me, it gave me an analogy. If you had a virus, if you were sick, if you've ever had a really bad virus, I know I've had viruses at times where my whole body felt it. Um, I didn't know if I was going to recover from it. I felt like that I, three or four or five days of a fever, vomiting stomach. I don't know if I'd ever eat again. I felt like that this virus had taken over my whole body taken over my mind, taken over everything. I am sick, take over my identity for that time. But then my immune system kind of kicked in and said no, and the virus was gone. And so I said to him, I said, I really think that this is something that's playing through you right now. Something that's infused into you that's, that you've picked up and brought into your spirit and you feel like this is who you are. I said, but at your core, this is not what God made you to be. And I'm just going to trust that he's going to, it's just going to play out. And you're going to find out on the other side of this, that um, it's something that was a seasonal thing, something that, that just played through you like a virus. And he said, well, God would have to rewire me. And I said, okay. I said, that's just what we'll, we'll pray for. And I, and I just tried to speak kindly to him and very restorative to him. There was no condemnation in his life. And I'm just saying, I'm here for you to try to help you. Let's talk through this. The next week, his parents, um, they were Bible study teachers. They brought this uh, beautiful redheaded girl over to the house. And it really was not in their intention. It was not by design. It was just, she just happened to be their Bible study. And he said to me later, he said, you know, I was sitting across from her on the couch and I looked at her and he said, God rewired me right on the spot. And he said, <laughs> and uh, so there was, uh, there was a, a transformation that happened right there in that, in that living room. And uh, he started uh, dating that beautiful redheaded girl. Did he still struggle from time to time? Yes. Yes, he did but the power of the Holy Spirit was beginning to work in his life. And what I want to just say that I believe that we have to walk this fine line of grace and truth, that we have to know the truth, we have to hold on to the truth, we have to believe what the Word of God says. And if God says this, and such were some of you, God can deliver, He will deliver. Um, and so we have to believe that this is our ultimate desire and design is that there's going to be a point when someone says, you know what, I don't think I want to live this way anymore. I want to come out of this. We have to have the grace. And so that means that there's going to be a lot of people around us. We all know someone. We've all been through certain things. Uh, judge me if you want to for whatever I've said today, those different points of my life where things tried to touch me. But God was showing me how easy it can happen. And at different stages of my life and at different stages, even of ministry. And yet God delivered me from this. And God, God can deliver anyone. God can help anyone, no matter what stage that you are at, if you will hear the voice of God. And so my desire today is that somehow the church can be a refuge, can be a safe place, that we can be open, that we are not condemning, that we are not getting up in the pulpit and beating people up, but at the same time saying, hey, if this is what you're struggling with, uh, there is deliverance for you. There is help for you. And such were some of you. That's my ultimate goal. But I do not want us to be bullied. I do not want us to feel like that we have to give up all of our ground but that we have to understand what the agenda of hell is to just try to destroy the family of God and to try to destroy the family dynamic. This is in order to infuse the, the, the world with a pagan 
uh, way of life that goes against um, the truth. And we'll have to pick this up more, perhaps in other broadcasts, maybe deal with Leviticus 18 uh, at some point. But uh, we love you. God bless you. Let's close this broadcast out today. And let's pray a prayer that there can be a, an influx of people that can be healed, that can be delivered, uh, that will be set free, and that we can have many, many testimonies of people that can say, yep, that's me. In this time, such were some of you. Yep, I was one of them, but God set me free. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, today that you love us right where we are. Oh God, there are so many things that are detestable to you, uh, so many sins that are opposite of your divine image, your divine nature, your word, and your way. Today, God, I've done my best to try to speak with humility and to speak with transparency, oh God, and to know that the enemy is there to try to destroy, he is vicious, trying to swallow up a generation, oh God, but we are standing today, we are praying in Jesus' name that there would be deliverance, we are praying in Jesus' name that there would be a drawing, that in Jesus' name that there would be a healing, and that if you are against it, then you will also provide, oh God, not just truth, but also grace grace. And so I ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, let there be a healing and a deliverance. We have seen it many times in our churches, oh God, where people have come in with alternate lifestyles and been delivered and set free. I thank you, Father. We have seen trans uh, people come into our churches, oh God, and be set free and delivered. We thank you, Father, oh God, that you, can, that you can set all the captives free of any type of sin, oh God, but especially, Lord Jesus, today as we discuss these things, oh God, and the nuances, Lord Jesus, that are around this. It's so difficult for us. We want to do the right thing. It seems like it's a catch-22, oh God. But we thank you, Father, that there is nothing that is too complex, that you cannot help us, that you cannot deliver us, that you cannot give us strength, and you cannot help us, oh God, to see the family restored, to see our homes renewed, and the institution, oh God, of the church, oh God, respected, and the authority, oh God, of the body of Christ, oh God, re remained intact. And for the homes, oh God, to be repaired in Jesus name in Jesus name we thank you for it well I hope this has helped somebody today God bless you we love you we are praying for you and praying for your families we look forward to a great weekend in St. Louis this is our uh, biannual uh, world uh, world prayer uh, summons the summons to sacrifice the uh, the initial and original one that is our uh, uh, headquarters um, based prayer or uh, prayer conference uh, summons to sacrifice in St. Louis happens every other year. Uh, I will be one of the speakers there, of course, with our general superintendent. Um, uh, starting it off um, uh, tomorrow night, uh, David K. Bernard. There'll be other speakers there. Tremendous. Uh, tremendous outpourings of the Spirit and insights. So God bless you. Thank you so much for being a part of our broadcast. If you can be a part of that, make your way to that summons. Uh, if you can watch online, watch online. And we pray that Prayer Nation will be strengthened all around the world today. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. God bless you. We love you. And we'll talk to you again soon.